Right, I'm being firmly instructed to start, um, which I think means people need to slowly sit down if you aren't going to distract my distinguished panelists from their thoughts. Uh, right, so good morning. I, I'm, I'm e following up on a strategic panel with um, a panel which talks uh, narrows down on another piece of strategy. So I think probably over the last two days, you've heard quite a lot about how we should be thinking in the long term about Europe, what's Russia's place in Europe, uh, what's the role of the military now um, in the wake of events in Crimea, um, what's the, you know, how, how we should be thinking differently about energy in Europe. Those are all the kind of elements of hard power, economic power. Um, but actually, as Steve Hadley said on the last panel, there's a third piece of long-term strategic thinking about Europe, and particularly about um, Europe to the east of the European Union, which is the, I actually didn't like the word soft power very much, uh, because it reminds me of bad books that become bestsellers. Um, but, but the non-military piece, um, the media piece, um, the, 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 the translation of our message story. Maybe that's, uh, maybe, maybe that's the right term. Um, much of, one of the very unusual things about Putin's war on Ukraine has been its non-traditional aspects. So in some way, you, you know, there's, and there's a, you know, the unconventional use of the military, but also a propaganda war of a kind that we haven't seen for a generation and maybe ever. Um, my Russian friends tell me that Russian television now, to them, seem, is nothing like what it was in the Soviet period. It's very slick, it's very sophisticated, it comes in different forms on different channels, um, but the messages are all very, very well and very carefully crafted, um, and in very in many cases deeply dishonest. Um, this is a kind of assault on reality, in a way, and on, and, and on the truth and, on the, and the, on the way that the world works that we haven't really seen before and we haven't really thought about before. Um, it's not like we're not dealing anymore with boring Soviet television and combine harvesters and statistics about grain production and so on. We're dealing with a very sophisticated modern media that looks very much like our media in some ways, but um, is telling a very dishonest story. Um, to discuss that particular problem and how um, the West can think about it, how Europe can think about it, how the United States can think about it, I have two of actually the most distinguished people you could find um, to, to discuss this. Um, on the far left, not politically, but um, geographically on the stage, is David Enser, who was a reporter for ABC News and CNN in the past, um, says that for this panel, the most relevant thing about him is that he was twice locked up in Wrocław during martial law in Poland. Um, and detained in some cellar uh, somewhere near here, and with, you know had his cameras smashed and was eventually set free. Um, he uh, right now is director of the Voice of America, but interestingly, and this is one of the things I want to ask him about, was also in charge of creating a broadcasting strategy for Afghanistan in the first days after the Afghan war. So he's thought quite a lot about um, how to recreate broadcasting or how to, how to, how to make messages and how to make even truth-telling work in very difficult conflict-ridden situations. Um, in the middle, again, not politically, uh, is Tom Malinowski, who says that for the purposes of this panel, the really important thing is that he was born in Swapsk. Um, <coughs> he has had also a number of distinguished roles, um, most notably as the Washington Director of Human Rights Watch. Um, he is now Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Labor, and Human Rights um, in, the, in the US government. So we're very pleased to have both of them here today. Um, and I will start with um, Tom. Um, you know, we were talking at breakfast about this new kind of Russian media, the new kind of propaganda, and, and new ways to think about it. And you began sketching out for me um, you know, a role for the United States, a really bit of role for the United States and Europe and for the West in general. How should we be thinking about this now? What are, what are our options in terms of what, what could we do next? Sure. Um, let me just let me try to frame how I think of it um, and then get to the specifics of which media is one but only one uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the areas where we need to be active. Um, for, first of all, I've, I've been struck by the extent to which everybody is emphasizing the military side uh, of the challenge in, in the last uh, few days, not just here but in all the discussions we've been having around Europe. And on the one hand, that is understandable. It is appropriate, given the stakes, given uh, the threat, given the history. And the United States will do what it takes, as President Obama 
made clear on that square in Warsaw and in all of his discussions with leaders uh, here uh, in, in Europe this week. I think the most robust description I've heard from an American president of what Article 5 of NATO means, I heard from President Obama uh, on, on Wednesday in Warsaw. But that said, we need to acknowledge that the, the military side of this, ironically, is playing <laughs> Um, all that is about is defending the space in Europe that is still free. It is not the way in which we are going to win what Radek Sikorsky appropriately described as a, um, a contest of ideas, which we have to win, we have to want to win. Um, how do we do that? I think we need to go to the heart of the problem, to the heart of the drama. And for me, this drama didn't actually begin in Ukraine or in the Maidan, in Balatnaya Square in, in Moscow. Uh, three years ago when we had this extraordinary mass movement of ordinary Russians challenging the uh, increasingly authoritarian uh, regime in the Kremlin, which produced an extremely um, harsh, brutal, um, and to some extent paranoid response on the part of Putin, who imagined that this was all part of a Western, in a, in a sense, soft power conspiracy, promoted in all kinds of ways. And then when the Maidan train um, the example of something like that succeeding in Russia's neighboring country was too much to bear, uh, and so we have the drama that we have today. So how do we get at that heart of the problem? Um, I think, number one, um, we have got to step up and we will be stepping up our efforts to provide a lifeline to uh, those who share our values uh, in the region, including inside Russia itself. Uh, and sadly, a lot of that work of helping society, of helping independent media, um, of partnering with, expressing solidarity with Russians who are trying to bring a different kind of day in Russia will have to be done outside of Russia because a lot of people are leaving. They are fleeing the climate of increasing repression inside the country. And so we are working with folks uh, in, uh, with Russians in Estonia, in Lithuania, in Kiev, in Poland, um, who are continuing this very, very brave work which ultimately has to win for this struggle to, to be successful. Two is the counter-propaganda, which we'll talk more about with, with David. Um, and there's a lot I think we can do there. There's a lot that we are thinking about and beginning uh, to do. I would just stress that this is a long-term effort. We cannot do what Putin does. We should not do what Putin does. Uh, President Obama is not going to be giving out 300 medals to journalists for defending the interests of the state, as Putin recently did. So what we do is by definition going to be less organized and slower, but I think ultimately will be much more effective. And then three, something that I haven't heard a lot about uh, in, in these discussions, um, I think we need to focus a lot more on what I think is Putin's number one domestic political weakness, and that is corruption. The one issue that unites virtually everybody in Russia and Ukraine, whether they are on the nationalist or liberal side, against the status quo is this sense of a state that steals from the wealth of the nation and deposits that wealth in foreign countries. Um, and we haven't done a good enough job of that. We've, we've, we've done, I think, a very good job in helping the Ukrainian government, for example, begin to recover assets that were stolen by Yanukovych. But in a sense, what we've done again and again and again through, through our asset recovery, anti-corruption sanctions work, is we've, we've sort of imposed a, a, a departure tax on leaders who are being overthrown. We haven't done as good a job using these mechanisms with respect to countries where a leader like that is still uh, in power. Um, and so through a whole range of efforts, through assistance to civil society in these countries to expose the problem, information sharing between the United States and European allies, um, and a more concerted effort, um, not just through our foreign ministries, but our finance and justice ministries, to crack down on the flow of illicit funds, the proceeds of corruption and of abuse of power uh, in the East to our financial systems. In the long run, that's the way to play offense. And I see that also as a form of soft power. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. I, would, I, I agree very much with your point about corruption. I know <coughs> we'll pick up the other, the other points as well. Mm -hmm. um, my experience is that the, you know, the, 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 this, this small but committed group of Russians um, in Moscow who um, you know, who, who, who really do oppose the status quo, one of their main critiques of the West, and this is of both of Europe and the United States, 
is that, you know, what, you know, how can you show us any leadership? How can you, how can you even pretend to give us any direction when you are laundering our oligarchs' money and our oligarchs are sending their children to your schools and they are buying houses in Hyde Park and in, in, in Manhattan? You know, what, what kind of moral leadership is that? I mean, it's, it probably is the main element that undermines any Western claim to leadership um, in, in that part of the world. Um, we'll go back to that. Uh, I, I wanted David sort of, it will sound odd um, to take lessons from Afghanistan for Europe. Um, very odd. Um, but David ran, uh, created, you know, you, create, you created really from scratch um, a communication strategy in Afghanistan. Can you talk a little bit about that and you, how, how some lessons from there apply here? Or what, what did we learn from trying, to do, from trying to do that six or seven years ago? You know, the, um, the term nation building is, is, uh, is fraught and people don't like to use it. And it's like soft power, yeah. Right, right, one of those. <laughs> Uh, and yet, uh, let's be honest, um, there's, there's, there's nation building needed in a lot of places. Um, and we want strong nations that we can be allied with and be helpful to. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, the, the project, well, a cu couple of the things that we did uh, that we thought were helpful. Uh, for example, uh, we funded a, uh, the, the State Department funded, and I worked for it, um, a, a television series, a reality television series about the Afghan army. And basically we uh, profiled young recruits from different tribes who arrived in their civvies, which looked very different from each other, who clearly didn't like each other very much. And it's an old story. You see them getting haircuts, getting uniforms, uh, uh, training in, in, in trenches together and becoming bosom buddies. And before long there's an army, a national army. Uh, Ukraine's going to need one of those too, and it's going to need to have Russian speakers in it as well as Ukraine speak Ukrainian speakers. So uh, I think that uh, Ukraine needs, and whether we help them or not, uh, needs to uh, uh, have some heroes and build some sense of pride in national, in, in, the, in the sort of uh, talismans, the, the, the items that you need to be a nation. You need a strong army. You need to end corrupt, you need to reduce corruption, you need to be fighting corruption. You need a police force to do that. Um, another thing we did in Afghanistan was a, a, a completely fictional series on television about a sort of a cop show in which the, for Afghans, unique concept was presented that policemen might solve crimes and that they might actually be against bad guys and for good guys. This was something new for Afghanistan. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the show was aimed at teenagers. But that's where it needed to be aimed. That's where the bulk of the population is. That's where the demographic bulge is. And that's the future. Uh, so it was getting those kids into schools, getting them educated. And by the way, over the whatever it is, 10, 15 years that more than 50 countries have had troops in Afghanistan, um, there have been 70% uh, of the school age kids have been in school, and 30% of those were female. That's the kind of change that even if the Taliban does take back parts of the South and become more of a player as troops draw down, uh, can't, be, can't, be got written of, can't be gotten rid of. That's change here that I, I believe uh, has staying power. So it's looking for ways to help Ukraine, I suppose if we're talking about Ukraine, uh, to, to build a nation, to um, f build the, the, the institutions, and to have pride in them. And there's definitely a soft power, I don't know what phrase we should be using here, um, a piece you, of that. You're talking about media. I'm talking about media. Uh, another thing that we, uh, we certainly tried to do was encourage uh, free media in Afghanistan. And uh, Voice of America and Radio Free Europe try to do the same in many countries and would like to try to up our game now in Ukraine, which is where I'm going after I leave here. Um, we already have relationships with uh, a number of the television and radio stations in Ukraine. We have programming on them. We, have, uh, we do training and we, uh, we try to uh, kind of build, help them build their confidence and their abilities. Um, and we, we do programming that, uh, well, we were talking, you were talking about corruption. You know, I, we have a corruption correspondent at Voice of America. And when he's not doing stories about corruption around the world, he does simple stories about a mayor be on trial in some state somewhere. What does a society with the rule of law do with a corrupt mayor? This is what we do. And we just show that. It's very powerful. 
So I think there's a, a, a big role now, an important role that we can play to assist. So the question about media is, so there's a, I know that there are, I even discovered this morning, there are now several projects afoot to tell, help fund or seed or begin or inspire um, better Russian language television in the region, and whether it's going to be based in the Baltic states or whether it's going to be based in Kiev. Um, you know, the, 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 the idea is that because Russian television is so slick and watchable, it's more attractive than anything else that's available to Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine and e even in, even in uh, Estonia and Latvia. Um, the question is really for both of you, what's the best model? Um, is it a Voice of America type model with, I don't know, European or American funding for a new television station? Is it private TV? What would you like to see? Um, what, what do you think would work best um, in, in this current atmosphere, given, given what we know about, the, you know, Ukrainian television is already right now very politicized um, and different power groups own different stations, including the president, the new president. The, the, I mean, there's such great needs in this area for Ukraine and for other parts of the world that we're talking about that uh, we probably need both. I mean, I'm a federal official now, but I spent 32 years in in the private media, and I fundamentally believe that the best, the first and most important answer is private. Mm -hmm. um, a Russian language television station uh, that uh, was commercially successful, that had uh, popular entertainment programming on it, that uh, could show the World Cup and, and, and have sports events that people want to watch on it, and sure, advertising to support that, and then some news programming uh, that uh, was honest, that had the goals of accuracy and objectivity and comprehensiveness that the Voice of America Charter has uh, would be the ticket, I think, and badly needed. Uh, I worry about, and I know a lot of people do, about the, uh, the, Rush, the loyalty of the Russian minorities in countries like Latvia, where the, I think, is it 42% of the, of, of the population are uh, Russian origin? Uh, and what are they watching right now? As far as I know, it's mm -hmm. Kremlin television. I think uh, the Baltic states uh, need to look closely at ways to reach out to, to embrace their Russian minorities and welcome them as Baltic citizens. Uh, and you can do that with Russian language television, for example. So there are a lot of different ways of putting this together, and there are a lot of discussions going on about that right now, as I'm sure you know. Um, I'm going to Kiev to see what the Ukrainians think, because I think that's a key part of this. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Tom? I know you've thought about this too. Yeah. I, I, the, the basic idea here is that there's a huge demand among um, people in, I guess we can call them the peripheral states from the Baltics down to Moldova, Ukraine, Crimea, um, for independent Russian language broadcasting that's honest and, and hard hitting, uh, that provides both news and I think most people say entertainment as well to draw in a, a large audience. And there is unfortunately also a growing supply of independent Russian journalists who mm -hmm. may not have uh, a job to go to uh, because of the crackdown inside Russia. And so part of, I think, of what we need to do is to marry that supply and that demand, but then to, to let those people decide the best way to do it. And, and I think there will be room for both. My sense is that probably the greater demand will be for private independent broadcasting because that will be more credible. By definition, if it's independent, we're not going to be able to just create it and make it happen. It has to happen organically, but with assistance, collaboration, um, with the United States, other European countries playing a kind of convening, facilitating role, um, helping to find private financing if that's what's needed. And it's going to take time, but I think we can do it. We know how to do it. We've done it before. Yeah, I think a piece, and, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. you know, what, I think what, what comes out of this effort will, I think, be far more powerful in the long run than what we're countering. So I think a piece of this is probably also, uh, and I, I, I talked to people about this in Kiev when I was there, is also a decent media law, a set of media laws and regulations in Ukraine um, to make sure that there's an even playing field, to make sure that um, uh, you know, there are laws about percentage of ownership of the media and so on, which, which we are used to in the West. One of the oddities, I've worked on this myself in the last couple of years, we in the West very often tend to say, right, we believe in free press, free media, um, and we go around the world and evangelize about this. Um, and we fail to acknowledge 
what kinds of, are we, and we, we, don't even, we don't recognize and don't think about the kinds of regulation that the media is subjected to at home, whether it's libel law or um, you know, various laws governing hate speech or whether it's laws governing percentage of ownership of, of media. You know, we're used to all those things and we often fail to explain that that's part of, um, part of what makes a healthy media is a decent set of regulations for it to live within. Um, and you, 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 you know, I, I found, I went to Libya a few years ago and found that Libyans thought that free media meant anybody could say whatever they wanted, even if it was a lie and even if it could be, even if it was libelous. Um, and it's often, I think, important for Westerners talking about this to remember what our own system really is and not what we, what we imagine it to be. But, um, yeah, can I also say that uh, we are doing things now. I mean, that the... the, the, the that the Voice of America and Radio Free Europe are doing things now that I think are small, that, that, they need, that we need to be doing more, but we've responded quickly to, uh, to the situation. Uh, we, before the Crimea happened, um, Voice of America had about a 9% share uh, of Ukrainians who would hear or see or read something from Voice of America each week. Now it's up to uh, 18 and climbing pretty fast. Um, with some help from our friends at the State Department, we've uh, got a small program now going in Russian uh, done by Ukrainians. So every day there's some news on the air on, channel, on, on television stations in eastern Ukraine uh, from the Voice of America in Russian, but prepared by Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a small thing, but it's the kind of thing that we were able to do quickly, and I like, I'd like to see us uh, build on. Radio for Europe has a lot of very creative um, ideas, and uh, one of the things that they're working hard on is sort of instantaneous response to lies. Quick response. There, there, what's there the, been what's the good, lie of the day? There have been some good Twitter and online uh, websites set up to deal yeah. with that as well. Yeah. So we're doing things now uh, in the short term. Um, I, I do think that the, the West needs to get back into this business in a serious manner, which costs money, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, budgets are needed. We're on a very tight budget. You know, the United States, obviously, the federal budget is very challenged and, and uh, uh, has been, uh, been cut. But, but this is, I think Americans underrate the power of this thing that we aren't going to call soft power. Uh, you know, we, we used to be very good at it, and um, we should take it more seriously than we do. Uh, Voice of America reaches 164 million people a week right now. Uh, and it has enormous influence. A quarter of the population of Iran watches at least one VOA show each week on television. Uh, this is not negligible. No, it's also true that retrospectively, when you look at the Cold War and what was done during the Cold War and what the West did during the Cold War, really almost the only, you know, other, the only soft power tactic you can point to that was ever of any effect at all was, were the radio stations. But even, the radio. even that, we forget how long it took. Mm. Um, there was, I sort of went back and read, read up on this history mm. before the conference, and uh, there, there was a, a famous conference in Wrocław in 1948. Uh, it was called the World Conference of Intellectuals, I think. And, I and heard about it. <laughs> the, it. Pablo Picasso and Aldous Huxley and all of these intele you know, intellectuals from the West came here. It was, of course, a Soviet-sponsored conference, um, which launched a propaganda campaign which went on for years. Millions of signatures signed in, uh, in Western European countries on petitions, as well as in the United States, calling for peace. It sounded very nice, but it was the Soviet propaganda campaign at the time. And I think at the time, people felt that the Soviet Union was winning the propaganda war in 1947, and in 1948, and in 1949, and in 1950. And what we were doing was extremely clumsy for, for years until we learned over time to get it right. With, without barely lifting a finger, we're ahead of where we were at the beginning of the Cold War. I mean, the only people who Putin is appealing to in Western Europe are far right-wing crypto-fascist parties. Although there are a lot more than there used to be, but yes. Um, so, you know, I think we, we need to approach this with an understanding that we have to have a little bit of patience, but also with a great deal of confidence in terms of our abilities, our tools, and the, the, the attractiveness of the ideas that, that, that yeah. we have to promote. And one other thing, you know, if, if, okay, I've been a journalist, so I'm biased. I've been a journalist all my life. But the thing that works at Voice of America is the charter, which says that we will, that, we, that, 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 that the Congress passed in 1976, President Ford signed, that said we are supposed to try to be, try to be 
accurate, objective, comprehensive, and so forth. That's what works. Uh, if, if, if Congress were to decide to, to tell Voice of America, for example, you know, make, all of your, make everything you say on the air be in conformity with U.S. foreign policy, that would not be good. That would not help our, our credibility, and, and credibility is the coin of the realm. It's because we have the confidence in freedom of speech and in the First Amendment of the American Constitution um, that we are such an influential broadcaster and that the United States has respect when it has it around the world. So I don't think propaganda is what's called for here. I think we're, we try to be in the truth business, and that's why we'll have an audience. You know, anywhere, people people listened to Radio for Europe in the past not, not to hear American propaganda, but in order to find out what was really going on in their own countries. That was, that was, that's, that was its function. Right, and to listen to jazz. And to listen to jazz, <laughs> indeed. Um, Tom, could you return to your corruption point? Um, because this is a, I mean, maybe it's particularly because I spend a lot of time in London at the moment, and it's a, it's a, it's a particularly clear problem there. Mm -hmm. Um, that it's very hard for the British government or indeed any European government to be critical of Putin or even to be critical of the Russian system, leaving aside personalities um, and, and, and Russian corruption, when, so, when there, there are such clear benefits to the city of London from that corruption. Um, it's a, it's a less, it's a less um, dramatic problem in the United States because the numbers are smaller. But certainly in London, certainly in Germany, um, certainly in the south of France, um, I mean, certainly in particular ski resorts in the Swiss Alps, um, you can, you know, you can, you, you see the Russian money, you see that it's, it's, it, you know, the Russians are welcomed there with open arms. And by Russians, I don't mean Russian tourists, I mean very, very rich Russian oligarchs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm happy for Russian tourists to go skiing. Um, but, what, you know, from within the U.S. government, um, what kind of influence do you have over that, that particular problem? Do you have, have you thought about how to solve it? Um, how, how, how do we begin talking about it? We, well, we've thought a great deal about it, actually. This is not just me. You know, I'm speaking for, for my colleagues in, in suggesting that, that this is a big part of the long-term challenge that we face, and we're having a lot of conversations about how to hone a variety of tools, um, most of which we already have, but many of which we haven't used quite as assertively as we might um, to address that problem, not just in Russia, but around the world. Because, I mean, I, I see this as the person in charge of our human rights and democracy diplomacy as, um, as, as in some ways, the, 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 the root of, 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 of most authoritarian challenges that, that we face. Russia is not unique in, in, in this sense. And also the thing that, that is the hardest thing for most authoritarian dictators to defend. It's, it's easy for Putin to rally 85% of his people in a patriotic campaign to retake Crimea. It's relatively easy for him, at least in the short term, to rally at least some of his people against the United States and Western Europe championing human rights in Russia, which he can frame as an alien Western agenda. It's about gay rights, et cetera, et cetera. It's much harder for him to rally public support against a campaign to stop Russian oligarchs from looting the state and putting their money into property in the French Riviera. So just emphasizing that rhetorically, I think, gives us more of an advantage. In terms of what we can do, you know, if we'd been having this conversation a year or two ago, um, somebody might have said, you know, if you're really serious about Russian corruption, you should sanction people like Sechin and Yakunin and the Rotenbergs and all these people. And people and, were saying that a year ago. And, and, and as a US official, I might have been a little uncomfortable. I probably wouldn't have been able to say very much, and it would have sounded rather unrealistic. And thanks to Putin, in a sense, as Minister Sikorsky was suggesting, we, we now have done all those things. Um, and with that comes a whole large bureaucracy of people who are, again, not in the State Department, but in the enforce law enforcement branches of our government, whose job is to track the wealth of those people, to figure out the shell companies that they're putting it into, um, to conduct what is really more a law enforcement than a foreign policy operation. And I think what we're, what, what, the, the challenge here is to try to move this more into that kind of mode of thinking, so that whether it's Russia or any other sort of authoritarian kleptocratic government, we, we can, when we must, carry on diplomatic relationships, but at the same time, the enforcement sides of our governments are talking to each other, cooperating, 
and doing their thing in terms of sending out notices to banks um, and um, you know, conducting prosecutions where the evidence is available, gathering that information, which is there to be gathered, but we don't always make a priority of it, um, so that this happens at the same time. Um, and in terms of London, I kind of like to make, you know, um, make it easier for ordinary English people to be able to afford the rents in the city of London. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so I, there's a side yeah. benefit. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, I have a, we have a very short, this is a very short session, but I will take one or two questions or comments. Um, if, let's, let's take two at once, and two or three at once, and then you all can answer which piece of it you would like. Why don't, why don't you say your name? So, Fran Burwell from the Atlantic Council. Um, two questions. In the democracy dialogue that we held just before the forum started, there was a lot of discussion about traditional versus social media as a way of getting the, way out, the word out. Uh, and I sensed among that group a reluctance to rely entirely on social media and other new forms of media. So I'd like to hear a little bit from you two about that balance. Um, since obviously old media is uh, somewhat more expensive, it seems. The other question, though, is the larger one. The previous panel talked about whether there was a way to move forward with a relationship with Russia over the long term, should the behavior of the government change. But in some discussions I've had recently with young Russians, I've been uh, concerned with how quickly their worldview has changed so that they see the same things that happen in an, as we do, but in an entirely different way. And I'm wondering how you feel about the way we have these contrasting, if we do develop contrasting visions of the world, what does that do to our ability to have a positive relationship over the long term? Okay, let me take a couple more because there's only going to be time for one round. So there's gentlemen back there. I have blinding KGB lights in my eyes, so forgive me if I can't tell who you are. So. Um, Alan Riley, City University. I, I just wanted to follow up on what you're saying about the City of London, which I agree with you, but I also think it's, 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 there is an opportunity there. When you actually dig down into the details of, of the actual Russian commercial influence in London, uh, it's actually relatively small, but I think the perception of its scale and impact uh, actually influences uh, British policymakers uh, more than the actual the reality. So I actually think there's a real opportunity to um, bear down on this, uh, this sense that we can't do that much because of the city. Actually, the, Russian, the overall actual Russian footprint is, is relatively small. What I think also it leads to is another kind of British thing which is not talked about, and that is the, well, not much talked about, and this is the actual, the, all of the over, overseas territories, the Cayman Islands, the Bahamas, and so forth. I actually think it is there that you actually have the greatest, um, if you like, uh, input where, the, where you could do something and have an effect and where there is a reluctance to act because of the relationship between the UK and the overseas territories. It is there where all the Russian money is stuffed away in the British Virgin Islands, the Caymans and so forth, where we need to do something. And that's perhaps about an OECD, EU, US operation in relation to controlling uh, offshore holdings which we've been doing in the OECD anyhow, and we could do a lot more with. So it seems to me there are opportunities there and pressure points we could use. I'll stop there. Let's do one more, sir. There's a woman back right here. Which microphone will get there first? Beata Ocepka, University of Wrocław. Uh, would you have any recommendations for European Union public diplomacy in Ukraine? I mean the EU as a whole, not the member states. All right, so the three, three, three separate subjects. On the overseas territory issue, um, I saw some statistics recently that showed, I, I'm not going to remember it off the top, but something like a third of the money generated in the city comes via these your overseas territories, either legal fees or kickback, you know, what it, you know the, the, the fact of the, the overseas territories are an incredibly important part of why the city of London works. Um, so I can imagine getting rid of them is, um, is, is very difficult. But I also agree with your point about perception. Um, and it's not only a UK problem. Um, German trade with Poland is larger than German trade with Russia. But because German trade with Russia involves two or three or four or ten very, very large companies, um, including Siemens, you know, Ruhrgas, and so on, 
it's, they seem to have a disproportionate amount of influence over German foreign policy. Um, I think it's an issue in a lot of countries that if you look at trade with this region, with Central Europe, with, even with Poland by itself, it's often larger or more important or more significant, but it tends to be medium-sized companies and at a different level, and it le has less political influence. Um, but David, why don't you go first? Pick, pick whichever of those topics you'd, you'd well, like social, to answer. Well, let me do social media versus uh, the, the sort of old media, if you want. Um, if, you know, we do a lot of polling, and, and there's no question that in, even though social media is coming up fast, the way to reach the largest number of people is on the television um, in most countries, certainly in Ukraine. Uh, that said, um, in a place like Russia where we're jammed and blocked and our licenses are stopped and all the rest of it, I mean, new media is fantastic. And social media is a fabulous way to reach out to young Russians. And we're doing that aggressively. And I'd like to see us do more. Um, it's, it's a way to, it's, and it's a, the great thing about it is it's a way to engage. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to communicate, have a conversation, if you will. We have a show called Podelis, uh, on, uh, which, is a, which is an online television show once a week. Uh, and the, the young Russian viewers tell us each week what they want it to be about the next week and are very much engaged in it and they're on the show on Skype and all the rest of it. And it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of exciting, the kind of conversation you can have. Not with a very large number of people, but with a very intelligent, interesting, and um, a good target audience, as we like to say one that uh, will, we, we think have influence in Russia going forward. So there's definitely a growing role for social media and for uh, new media of various kinds. Uh, but um, if you want to get a lot of people now, today, television. Tom, do you feel like dealing with the EU and its public diplomacy? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Important, but I, I don't know that world. So I, let, let me take your second question, Fran. Um, I think one of the advantages of conceiving of this as a contest of ideas is that it then does not have to be a contest between the United States and Russia, between East and West. The ideas that we, I think most of us in this room, are troubled by are held by some people in Russia, but also by many people in the West, as we have seen. The ideas that we are promoting are championed by many people in Russia. In fact, it is precisely because they are championed, the, the liberal idea of, of a state serving its citizens rather than the other way around, precisely because that idea is championed by so many people in Russia that we have this crisis, because that is what Putin is reacting to. That's what happened in 2011. That's what almost got him out of the Kremlin. Um, so I think we need to hold on to that and to make this about a unifying campaign that brings people together across these artificial divides around a set of ideas that are shared by people very, very broadly. Um, and then on, on back to the corruption point, again, I think it's an example of how this crisis has been a clarifying moment for many of us, for many of our governments. Um, it has encouraged many of us to start thinking even more seriously and more urgently about things that we probably needed to do anyway, um, to make our own democracy stronger, more transparent. And, um, you know, in terms of the anti-corruption side and cleaning up the loopholes in our own financial systems, that is ab that's absolutely going to be hard. Um, but we have a good reason to do it now, and I want us to seize on that moment and do it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I think we'll end with that, and we'll end with the idea of unifying around a set of ideas, not around an individual country or political program. And I think that might be somewhere in there the beginning of the answer to the EU public diplomacy issue as well as to European and American public diplomacy as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to my panelists. <laughs>